it's Abby and it is 5 o'clock p.m. on the 22nd of January 2023. I am here in Cusco um, where things are again pretty quiet but uh, things are expected to pick up in striking action again soon. So uh, the weekend has been fairly normal around the Cusco area from the perspective of being able to go out and do what you need to do and being able to have uh, an assortment of you know, activities go on and whatnot. I myself um, went this morning out to Chinchero, the town where I grew up, for a uh, mass for the uh, health and recovery of a really close family friend. And um, then we all gathered and, and hung out with him and we all hope he's gonna get better. And uh, then I came back to Cusco to work on this report and some other things that I need to get squared away today. Um, I took public transit, a colectivo, in both directions, um, which is inexpensive um, and generally like totally a, it's kind of the usual way that, that you would go um, as a Peruvian person. And there were no roadblocks anywhere along the way to Chinchero and they weren't in place when I came back either but you could see in a number of places that, you know, the roadblock materials, giant tree trunks, big rocks, that kind of stuff had been pushed to the side of the road and are ready to be deployed again, you know, when that becomes necessary if roadblocks start up again, which, like I say, people believe they likely will um, tomorrow, Monday, the 23rd. Um, we are still, uh, we are still fine as far as the airport functioning here in Cusco. Um, the airport in Arequipa and the airport in Juliaca, Puno are not functioning at this time. There are no flights in or out of there. So that does limit, uh, a lot of things. And the roadblocks have been, um, causing some weird effects in terms of, uh, what products are available and so on. Um, nothing is at emergency level yet really, except perhaps in Madre de Dios, which is a jungle region where they don't have potable water and supplies for potable water. Um, you know, I guess that's, that's chlorine and other things that you put in for water treatment um, have not made it because they normally come in by truck. And so the question is, can they be delivered by plane? And if so, to where? And then can they be trucked around the region? And a lot of logistical questions there. Um, let's see, there are still heavy duty protests around Peru in general. Um, and uh, increasingly news media is making distinction between protest activity and vandalism activity. Um, some people, some news outlets consider them to be linked and part of the same thing and other news outlets do not consider them to be linked or consider it to be the kind of thing where uh, vandalism type activities are um, crimes of opportunity shall we say right where because there are protests going on and police are busy then this other stuff goes goes down so for example people don't think that it's normal protest activity to try to sack a bank which happened in the Puno region, um, and then they burned the building when they were not able to get into the vault. Um, people think that's probably not protesters, but, um, you know, vandals and regular delinquents um, trying to do bank robbery will the police station has been burned and the police are busy. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, but there have been other um, instances of damage to property in Puno and in Arequipa, uh, primarily also in Huancabelica. These are um, places that are not very close to where I live. I mean, depending on how you look at it, but it's, you know, not very close. Um, there are other regions, so think other states if you're in the U.S., other provinces if you're in Canada, um, that, that kind of thing, right? Uh, and, and so that kind of stuff has been going on. There have also been, uh, vandal attacks and the burning of mining installations and mining encampments. Um, so those are, you know, attacks on economic stuff, um, economic activity and that sort of thing. So, you know, that's a big bummer. Um, that's a big bummer for folks who depend on that for a living. Um, 
And then again, there's also always tension surrounding mining because there are environmental concerns and concerns about who is actually making the money off of mining. So, you know, so that is also something that where there's always tensions going on, um, not only due to protests against the government. And so the question of whether those are linked to anti-government sentiment or um, just uh, happening at the same time or sort of as protests of opportunity uh, remains kind of open. There's not a lot of clear evidence. In fact, there's a lot of stuff where, you know, we don't have super clear reporting going on. And one of the things that's happening there is there are some reports of some protesters or vandals or both attacking uh, journalists, right? And this appears to be happening in a variety of different ways for a variety of different reasons. Like uh, if somebody thinks the journalists in question are from a notoriously biased news outlet, then they're not interested in talking to them sometimes. Um, if they, you know, don't have confidence that they're going to be represented well, then there is sort of um, there's there's hostility in in some of those cases. So anyway, um, yeah, there still are a lot of roadblocks up, even though generally speaking on the weekends, as everybody kind of laughs about at this point, uh, the protesting stops so that people can go shopping and see family and do stuff like that, right? So you can go to the mass for the health of your family friend and that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, in some places, however, they have not stopped blocking roads at all. And so that's a little bit unpredictable. In between Cusco and the Sacred Valley, everything's been pretty wide open. And that is all pretty good news as far as getting around. But, um, you know, only those of us who live here right now need to get around because there are basically no tourists. And um, that is stressful. That is very stressful for a lot of people. And the report is, uh, the reports are coming in uh, talking about massive amounts of money being lost because, you know, there are costs associated with doing tourist operations that have to be paid up front, you know, even for, you know, whoever's doing you gotta, you, you gotta lay out some money in order to have the capacity to receive tourists and do things with them and take them places, right? And so there are costs sunk into that that will not be able to be recovered, what with cancellations. Um, the hope for many people working in tourism is that those will be postponements rather than full-on cancellations. Uh, so that's so that's really tough. Um, people keep saying, well, what is it going to be like on the 23rd of February? And the answer is still, we don't, we don't, we don't honestly know. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, heck, if you ask me what it's going to be like at eight o'clock tonight, I am not sure about that either. Right. But, um, um, you know, pretty much everybody thinks that there's only so long Peru can hold out in this kind of condition. Like at some point, um, it becomes untenable and things have to give. Something's got to give, right? And so the question is um, where that is going to come from. Um, this was the subject of uh, the the lectures in the mass that I was at, the Catholic mass that I was at this morning. And um, the Pope has called for people to try hard to uh, have dialogue instead of conflict um, to arrive at functional solutions here in Peru and that kind of thing. Peru is formally, like legally, a Catholic country. It does have a state religion and it is Catholicism. So that's relevant. Um, but for the most part, uh, the Catholic Church and then the evangelical churches have not had a lot to say openly in terms of uh, top leadership making big statements or anything here in Peru, but, um, uh, you know, individual priests and churches have certainly been talking about that, talking about what's going on a lot and trying to help people find ways to cope. So that is, that is, um, that is interesting. And there's increasingly pressure on the churches in Peru to make pronouncements and statements about all of this kind of thing. And that's, that's tough because, uh, they sort of don't want to take a side, but they also are against human rights violations. And so folks are coming out, priests and church members are coming out um, 
and saying things against that. Uh, so that's so that's something. Um, anyway, people are really stressed out because there's no work, because there's no tourism. So here in, in Cusco, people are really stressed out. And, you know, that, that takes a toll. Um, so, yeah, um, there, there's... The word is that 95% of tourist reservations through July have been canceled. So this means that, like, you know, fancy hotels have fired or laid off workers. A lot of people are out of work. Um, and a lot of places, you know, like hotels are closing. Restaurants are pretty much all still wide open. Tourist activities are wide open, except for Machu Picchu. Um, you know, so which of course is all that most of the rest of the world cares about in Peru anyway is. But what about Machu Picchu? And um, you know, that's uh, that's that's sort of uh, the biting, the biting irony, or and irony isn't exactly it. But the thing, the the thing that stings sort of about uh, about all of this is that you know, with the closure of Machu Picchu and that being in response to lots of protests and everything, that kind of lends credibility to the perception that people here have that nobody in the rest of the world cares how many Peruvians die, um, but they do care if tourists are inconvenienced in a trip to Machu Picchu. So, um, you know, it's hard to think that there isn't some truth to that when now suddenly lots and lots of people are asking me if everything's okay because they've heard that there were like a hundred tourists stuck at Machu Picchu and you know that is obviously a big deal whereas more than 50 dead and hundreds of wounded didn't make a lot of international news <sighs> anyway um yeah, so uh, fundraising and support activities and support of uh, protesters in Lima are ongoing. And a lot of these take the form of artists, musicians, actors, trying to do whatever they can to raise funds, having fundraising concerts, um, donation drives, and donating large amounts of money and resources themselves. And then there are uh, collection efforts in lots of public places and spheres where they're gathering uh, food and supplies and uh, they're calling for people who work in certain kinds of um, lines of work such as being attorneys. They need a lot of lawyers now to represent all of the people who have been uh, detained and uh, potentially mistreated and potentially detained wrongfully and all of that sort of thing in the course of um, actions to break up uh, protests and uh, disperse crowds and stuff like that. Um, they're calling for m medics, you know, people who are doctors and nurses to be available to help with the fact that people are getting injured. And, um, you know, even if people are not injured in a protest, protests are also sometimes really physically challenging because you're gonna be out in the hot sun all day. So you get people who get dehydrated and a whole lot of that kind of stuff. And then you have to like treat people who get tear gassed and a, a lot of that kind of stuff, which is which is a bummer. And especially since a lot of people have uh, respiratory damage after COVID and everything, getting tear gassed is um, more um, dangerous than it would be if you'd never had COVID. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm saying some of the most dystopian stuff right now, um, and there it is. But at the same time, like, you know, f as far as how my actual life is affected here, like I keep trying to say, you know, no, there aren't always burning tires on the streets, even though sometimes there are. Um, yeah, I know, this sounds like... This, this sounds this sounds so weird, like this is hard to explain, but I guess massive civil unrest doesn't mean that everything is always like uh, a wild action movie where um, there are constantly riot police in the streets um, and rocks being thrown in one direction and tear gas canisters being thrown in the other. Um, it's not permanently like that. There's also all this time where you have to, you know, go to the supermarket and take out the trash and figure out if you need more shampoo, right? Like, yeah, these are, these are just 
just things that are going on. Um, if the um, if if the things that are promised and uh, suggested and making the rounds today for this week pan out, um, pressure on the current government to resign is going to increase, and that's not great news because they have mostly reacted to that by stepping up policing action as well. So that escalates and escalates and escalates and at no point does the government ever sort of try to take a de-escalation approach to this. So uh, let me see. Um, there's there's all of this there's all this kind of stuff and uh I'm, i just need to say that opinions are greatly mixed at this point as to whether or not there is a point to protesting so even people who support the objectives of the protesters which is to say that they want new elections they want uh, the president to step down they want her cabinet to go with her um which would normally be the way that it goes anyway they want congress closed and new elections called for all of these things and they want a constitutional assembly called to discuss constitutional change because many people feel that it is structural failings in the relatively young constitution, which turns 30 this year, um, that are allowing for extensive corruption and um, real problems in terms of being able to have a stable government, you know, where like we have not had a president make it to the two year mark when terms are supposed to be five years um, in kind of a while now, right? There, I think there have been more presidents in the past seven years than there were in like my entire life leading up to that point. I mean, I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate, but it's probably not far off. So, um, uh, yeah, so um, um, there's all of that. So what's coming up? What can we predict? We can predict, like we say, more road closures on uh, Monday, tomorrow, uh, the 23rd of January. Uh, they say that they expect to open the airport in Arequipa and have flights in and out, um, but that has not been confirmed yet. I'm not hearing that uh, people are flying in and out. I know folks who have plans and they don't know for sure if their flights are going to go. Um, so it may be a little longer before they open that airport again. Uh, we do know that there was damage to the uh, like approach lighting and some other stuff like that in the fighting that took place around that airport um, this past week. So um, that stuff has to be repaired, generally speaking, before they can resume operations at that airport. And they also tend to uh, harden the security provisions at an airport before they reopen it because then they have some idea of who they think is going to try to do what with the airport in terms of, you know, um, storming it, taking it, whatever. Um, so that's, so that's something that's still going on. Um, uh, college and university students nationwide are protesting even harder than they were before in the wake of police actions to remove protesters from the campus of San Marcos University in Lima, which is a major university in Lima. Uh, videos show police going into dorms and arresting even students who uh, you know, had ID and live in those dorms and that kind of thing. And um, many people feel that the videos show violations of human rights and uh, abuse and illegal arrest type techniques and tactics. So that is where there is a big call for lawyers to donate their time. And a lot of lawyers are doing that. But some lawyers have also been uh, getting beaten up by police, apparently, which is pretty intense. Um, um, so then there was, for example, uh, the entire association of lawyers in the military, military lawyers, um, called for uh, Dina Boluarte to step down and for negotiations to resume. So like even the army lawyers are like, no, this is not OK. Um, anyway, so that's 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 pretty heavy. There's a lot of different opinions about uh, all of this and where this goes. And in addition to. Um, all of that now, many of those students are calling for uh, um, leadership at San Marcos University to resign because they feel that they are complicit or responsible for the really authoritarian and kind of brutalitarian um, acts that took place yesterday that caused protests to 
ramp up um, uh, quite a bit nationwide in terms of the college demographic, the college and university demographic. So that's not just like students, it is also um, in many cases uh, professors and, and that sort of thing too. Um, we are seeing reports come in of missing persons, people who have gone to protest and have not been seen again yet or heard from and who can't be reached and uh, also some journalists that have gone missing. And so that is the kind of thing that tends to be very concerning under um, circumstances like this. So it's possible that some of those are injured people who are in hospitals and have not been identified yet. And it's possible that they are um, suffering some other fate that is as yet undetermined. Uh, I would say that um, at my reading of things as I scour lots of different news sources and listen to the radio and talk to people and uh, follow social media and a lot of this kind of stuff is that press is becoming more and more polarized. So that makes it harder for um, people who are not really long and strong in following Peruvian politics to have a clear sense of what's happening. Um, it's it's concerning. Um, we don't know where that's going to go. Um, but yeah, uh, every news outlet uh, seems more polarized than it was like even a week ago. And so that means that just reporting straight facts is challenging. So, you know, before I report something here talking about what's going on, I try to have at least three sources that corroborate it and uh, preferably five so that I can be sure that it is it is fairly consistent and that, that kind of stuff. And I'd like to give a shout out and say thanks to the journalists in my life and the media uh, teachers and that sort of things who have taught me how to do um, that kind of analysis and, you know, even think about things like editing videos. So shout out to some of those fantastic teachers in my life and family friends who have been involved in that kind of thing, because at least I have some sort of set of standards, I guess, right, or something that passes for them. Anyway, the big what's coming news are, number one, another national march is called for Tuesday the 24th. And most people think that roadblocks will start up before that, but that national march is probably going to be pretty big. And more people are heading from the south of Peru into Lima. And like more people are heading from Puno and from Arequipa and uh, so forth into Lima. And so uh, people who are in Lima are not getting ready to leave yet either. So that's that's tense. And um, possibly even more concerning, as if that wasn't concerning enough, the National Transport Union, which is truckers, like in the USA, this would be the Teamsters Union, um, has said that it is giving a span of 72 hours from today for Dina Boluarte and her government um, and the other members of her parla of her parliamentary crew and her her um, her cabinet to step down, and if they don't do so, um, the truckers union says that they will start a massive national march, seventy two hours from now. I, actually, I think it's sixty eight hours from now, um, if I remember the the time on that missive correctly. So. Anyway, um, you know, I'm trying very hard not to say anything along the lines of what I think should happen or anything like that, but we all, um, everybody here in the much beleaguered south of Peru is tired and stressed out and worried and scared about what is coming down the pike. People are scared that further protests are going to continue to make it very hard to have any sort of uh, functional economic activity and regular life. And people are also scared that there may be increasingly militarized and um, heavy-handed responses from the government. And so that's tense. All of that being said, I tend to agree with the people who say, you know, we can't just do this forever. Um, 
but I don't know what the point is where where things break and things and things change and things and things start to take a turn for the better. I do know that Peru has an incredible capacity to survive and Peruvians are some of the most resilient people in the world that I know and you know saying that people are resilient is not um something that those resilient people usually appreciate hearing. Uh, I can certainly attest to that myself as a person who has experienced some excitement in her life and been called resilient a time or two. Um, you'd much rather never have to have that capacity. Anyway, so that's, that's the update. If you're thinking of coming to Peru, I say still come, but be aware this is not the time for really tight timelines so like if you have 48 hours and you want to do eight specific things in the cusco area you know i so that's going to be a tall order even in the best case because this is latin america and that's not the way it works here but um it it is extra not like that right now um, on the other hand, you know, I have had like doctor's appointments and dentist appointments and, you know, gone to scheduled mass and, you know, and all of this kind of thing. While this stuff has been going on, you know, my nephew has class, you know, they, you know, you, you, you can't just freak out and panic and, and stuff like that. So people in Peru are like, all right, well, so if all the chicken is frozen and I hate eating frozen chicken, I'm going to eat something else then. Chicken's already frozen. I'm not hungry enough to eat that yet. Um, anyway, yeah, um, it's it's tough. It's tough to say. Like, um, I don't think there is a diplomatic way out of this without the current government of Peru making some real concessions to the people who are protesting. And I don't think that the people who are protesting are going to get everything that they want either. But... Um, I don't think dialogue can move forward until there is some sense of trust and possibility in there, and that does not exist now, and it is not um, enhanced or made more likely by increased police action. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I guess that's that. I will report in tomorrow and let you all know how things look at that point in time. Take it easy. No sooner had I published last night's update than this happened.